Good morning. Facebook too. It's five p.m. Jamie said that that was at five o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry that I missed so, that. I, 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 whichever we decide, we need to make a agreement for people that walk in halfway in. It, yeah. It isn't even a big. I checked last two weeks when you get your mail done and put the list of books. It was sure. It's kind of like sure. eight, and that didn't get any bigger. It might be what someone else thought. Well, no, since it, since it was decided and it was publicized at 5 o'clock, I think it's best we stick with that. Then, sorry, I didn't mean to confuse anybody um, by what's in here. So, well, I just didn't want people going home thinking 5.30 and walking up and thinking it was Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you for bringing that up. So I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. Then um, the bulletin then is incorrect. And um, let, let's um, keep it then at 5 o'clock. And everybody will know. And so that's how it is um, publicized online as well. And so keep that in mind, 5 o'clock tomorrow. Sorry about that. Cross it out if you have a pencil or pen. Uh, as we mentioned last week, though, uh, uh, Amanda, Tina, Beth Andrews, and Jim, and many of the par- other parents that helped involved with the Christmas program last week, thank you so much. That was a, a great success, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, poinsettias, again, they are uh, being sold at Country Gardens. You can donate those and decorate for the church. Please have them by noon tomorrow uh, here at the uh, the church. At, and there's $16 there. The Harbor will host a New Year's Eve party December 31st. Keep that in mind, 7 p.m. And a couple other announcements we've had there for quite some time. Take a look if you have a chance. Um, continue to... Uh, a couple prayer concerns. I'm just going to talk about a couple of those that we've added. One was for Emory Lindgren. He had been hospitalized again. Uh, for some internal bleeding, and but he's back home now, actually doing doing pretty well again. So he's going to be actually filling in for me one of these Sundays coming up. Just to talk about one of the other announcements. Yep. There will not be any Bible study 
Okay, no women's Bible study this, this next week. Okay. The next two weeks. Okay. Sounds good. And then a couple of other, um, we also added, there's, there's a number of people we have in our prayer concerns, and please take time to read through all of them. But the two we'd added, as I mentioned, was Amory Lindgren and then Carolyn Seitz. Um, many of you, I mean, most of you would remember her, but I don't know the details of what she's, what she's, what's going on. Do you know, Sarah? Um, I was just asked to include her because she had mentioned she had some health concerns. Okay. And um, they didn't have more details than that. Okay. But, and I was also going to say, Emery is going to start a new round of treatment. Oh, yes. After he fills in for us. So maybe he'll be able to talk a little bit about that then. So. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. Yes, and like I said, please take time and look through the rest in, in your time of prayer and keep these in, in your prayer. So, are there any other announcements? As um, Lori just said, you mentioned that there's no Bible study in the next two weeks. Um, but any other announcements or prayer concerns that need to be added this morning? All right. Sounds good then. I will have you please stand and we'll join together in reading. The, uh, the blessing for the fourth Advent candle is found inside uh, the first, at the very top of the bulletin. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. In your Son, Emmanuel, you have shown us your light and saved us from the power of sin. Bless us as we light the candles on this wreath. Increase our longing for your presence that at the celebration of your Son's birth, His Spirit might dwell anew in our midst, for He is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen. You may, oh, please remain standing, actually, um, for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin... God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our first opening hymn today, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 30. Thank you. 
and then now again for the Kyrie, page 57. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Please remain standing now for our hymn of praise, Good Christian Friends Rejoice, page 55. first reading this morning is from the book of Micah, the fifth chapter. But to you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Here ends our first reading. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 80, found on page 252, and we're reading the first seven verses responsibly.
Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth in you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show light in your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts. How long will you be angry despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors. And our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Here ends the song. Our second reading is from the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, See, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Here ends our reading. set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord has come to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Sound here? Can you, yeah, can you hear me? I think it's good, yeah. All right. Well, we are inching closer and closer to Christmas, and of course, uh, you just heard the reading today was uh, from the beginning of Luke. 
talking about when Mary went to visit uh, Elizabeth, and we get a little uh, a little bit of a story there, and then we get what's known as Ma- the Magnificat or Mary's Magnificat, and it's it's her more or less exclaiming the meaning and the significance of what was happening uh, literally inside of her, uh, what was what God was doing with the fact and the story of this child coming to be uh, through Mary in this case. And so the shocking, uh, the thing about this story though is in many ways what Mary describes here is, is, is not the traditional Christmas story. It's not uh, the traditional story of, of uh, this baby being born and, and, and things like that, that that just sort of give it this idyllic feel. But rather, what she's saying is nothing short of revolutionary. She's saying things that are upending the system, that are upending what that world was like at that time. Christmas, in other words, changed everything. The baby that was growing inside of Mary was the sign that everything was about to change and a new reality was about to dawn. Well, when everything is about to change and a new reality is about to dawn, what do we call that? We call that a revolution. We call that a revolution. And so today I'm, I'm going to look at this story. I'm going to look a little bit at what's, what Mary is saying here. And I'm going to share a, a, a song with you. I'm not going to play it today. I have a song that I was going to maybe work on and play. I didn't have the time to get it. But I do want to share it with you because I think it also gets at it. So it's going to be a multimedia sermon, you could say. But the title of it is A Revolutionary Christmas. And I want to start by introducing um, one of the stories, the Christmas stories, we don't often hear read. And it's the Christmas story from Matthew. Just after... um, uh, it. We have the story of the conception of Jesus, and it's a, it's a few short verses in chapter 1 of Matthew. And then we hear the story of the Magi. And it goes like this, chapter 2 in Matthew, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Herod the king, Magi from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star... In the east of it, and have come to worship him. Now, when Herod heard this, when Herod heard, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written. Then Herod secretly called the Magi. And determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They rejoice exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother. They fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's usually where the story ends. But the very next verse, it says, And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, The Magi left for their own country by another way. And when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is in search of the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and while it was still night, left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt. I called, out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became enraged and sent 
and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. So there you have a slightly different rendition of the Christmas story, right? You have a slightly different rendition. And the reason I share that with you is because what we hear in Mary doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What we hear in Mary's Magnificat doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless we know the threat that Jesus was. Jesus was a threat to some. Not least the most powerful and the most wealthy at that time. So much so that Herod used the Magi to try to find out where Jesus was because he wanted to go and destroy him. And when he couldn't find Jesus, just to be safe, he had every child within two years of being born that was a male killed. It's shocking. It's sad. But that is the reality. When you hear Mary's Magnificat and you hear that what it means for Jesus to be born is that the rich will go away empty and that the powerful will be made low, that's a threat to somebody like Herod, right? So in in Mary's, if we go back to the the Magnificat, which we read just earlier, I want to just, I want to just summarize it in a way. I want to bring it together and uh, just clearly present a few things that are going on in light of the bigger story, in light of, say, the story from Matthew as we hear about Christmas. Three things that I I think are really going on in this revolutionary Christmas. Number one is that we have a redefinition of power. We have a redefinition of power. In verses 49 to 52 from Luke chapter 1, which I read earlier, and this is from Mary's Magnificat. Again, it says, the mighty one, the all-powerful one, the omnipotent one, has done great things for me, and his and his holy and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the powerful from the thrones and lifted up the lowly. Now just imagine, put yourself in the position of one of the powerful ones of of, of Rome hearing this particular um, type of talk. That this is what you you hear uptown at the cafe when you... You hear something's going on in a barn out in the, and, it, and it's threatening to you because you are the one that's being talked about. You are the powerful one. You are the proud one. You are the one who sits on a throne. And this baby now has come. And it's prophesied that all of that now has changed because of this child being born. He has shown strength. With this is how he shows strength. He scatters the proud in the thoughts of their hearts and brought down the powerful from their thrones. He has lifted up the lowly. Similar to this type of um, redefinition of power, uh, we see how what in, happens later in Jesus' life, um, not least the cross, also adds to the incarnation, that is the crucifixion and the incarnation together give us an entirely different picture of what power looks like. And Paul captures this in 1 Corinthians. And he says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it, to us who are being saved, It is the power of God. You see, to the world and to most, when they see a child in a manger, as vulnerable as any child has ever come into this world, to most, when they see uh, the God on a cross, it's foolishness and it's weakness. But 
But Paul says to those who are being saved, that is to those who know the saving power of God, to those who have surrendered their life to God, to those who have chosen to follow Jesus, those two things are what? They are the essence of the power of God. They are the power of God. And so it is. Power is redefined. Number two, in this revolutionary Christmas, we see a redefining of wealth. And just quickly, it says on, in chapter, uh, or in, our, in your bullets, you can see it in Luke chapter 1, beginning in 52, and going then through 53. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. We see that. And he has lifted up the, the, the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away. Empty. <coughs> Filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Here you have an axiom that is pretty much the case throughout the Bible. And that is wealth in our relationship with God at its most simplest can be defined as being hungry for God. If you're hungry for God, God is going to fill you. More than you can even imagine. More than you would ever desire and even know to desire. But it all stems, it all turns, it all pivots on the idea that we're hungry, right? That we hunger after God himself. And the same axiom comes true here. He says, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away in. The rich have many things, is what the text is saying. In fact, the rich have so many things that they're not hungry. And if they're not being hungry, they're not hungry for food, and neither are they hungry for God. And for that reason, they're sent away. And they miss out on the riches and the wealth that God gives. The riches of knowing God, of being uh, filled with the Spirit of God, of being, of knowing the love of God, of walking in step with the Holy Spirit, the riches of that only come to those who are hungry for that. And the text throughout the Bible, uh, as hard as the, the Bible is on, on people who have wealth, it's, it's not as prescriptive as it is descriptive and to say that it's just the case that when you're wealthy, you don't think you need God. That's why it says God or man. You can't have both. Right? And so the text is encouraging us in that way. Not to, not to take you know, the world we live in today, the America we live in today. We are all wealthy. I've said this a hundred times, if not two hundred times. We're all wealthy according to the standards of what the Bible would have known as to be wealth. And it's not to just, the Bible's not just there to sort of hit us over the head with that reality, but it's to remind us to not lose sight of hungering for God. To not let well, the wealth that we have turn us away from our need for God. And so find true wealth in that. Christmas is one of those places, and in the story of, 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 of um, Mary, the Magnificat, we're reminded of that. We're reminded that there's a redefinition of power, there's a redefinition of wealth, and then, and then lastly, uh, there's a redefinition of joy. Before I get into this redefinition of joy, I'm going to share with you, I'm just going to play a song that I had listened to recently that lays it out in music. This idea of Christmas. Of a God who makes himself weak in order to lift us all up and make us strong. So I'll get that set up here. Please. 
listen carefully to the words. the realities of what happens side by side on Christmas morning, that should give us pause. Lay the bread of heaven down beside the cattle feed. Think of that. The bread of heaven beside the cattle feed. The giver has become the gift lying here in desperate need. The manger stands in honored place, though by your world you are unknown, to stoop and kiss your common face is to bow before the throne. That's a redefinition of power. That's a redefinition of things. That is a revolutionary Christmas if there ever was. But as I said, the last thing I think it redefines is joy. And as this song ended, I want to use that as a springboard into what I say. Therefore, may we be content in search of God to look on you. If this is how you choose to come, this is how we come to you. At the very beginning of our text in Luke, Mary says something that is reiterated throughout every Christmas story in the Bible. And it's this idea of joy, good, great joy and rejoicing that comes in the fact and in the reality of what's happening. And so it is in verse 46, as we go back to the beginning, beginning, Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor 
on the lowliness of his servant. What is the joy that's happening here? Mary is talking about some kind of joy. In the story I read in Matthew, there is joy that comes up. If you read the story in Luke later on, great, uh, good news of great joy we hear about. Why? What is it about Christmas? What is it about this revolutionary Christmas that brings so much joy? To help answer that, I want to just briefly look at what we read from just a few minutes ago from Hebrews, what Lori read for us. It says there at the very beginning, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, See, God, I have come to do your will. You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings. He abolishes the first order to establish the second, and it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. At the very beginning of, of Hebrews there, Hebrews 10, 5, it says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world. This idea of coming into the world, that is the story of Christmas. Hebrews there is talking about Christmas. Consequently, when Jesus came into the world through the Incarnation, this idea of coming into the world or just coming into itself is echoed throughout Hebrews. Fifteen times, in fact, the word is Isarkomai. It means to come into. And it's in that one place that we see it is about God coming into the world. And the other 14 times in Hebrews, it is about the followers of God entering into the joy and the rest of God. If I could wrap that up, what I want to say is God came into the world so that we could enter into his joy. So that we could enter into his rest. Simply put. In Hebrews chapter 4, it's all about entering the rest of God. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering God's rest, any one of us may fall short of it. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter, those who formerly had good news preached to them, and if they fail to enter because of um, disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, and that is today, to hear the good news. And to enter in. This revolutionary Christmas redefines joy. Because it reminds us that the joy we seek is the joy we find in God. And the reason we can find that joy in God, that we can enter into that, is because God has entered into our world. That God has come and become one of us. In order that he might gather up all his sons and daughters, the children of God, those who have called upon his name, that they might come and enter into him, into his rest, and into his joy. That's Christmas. Christmas is revolutionary. It redefines power. It redefines wealth. And it even redefines joy. And so that's why throughout the Christmas stories, why is it such good news? Why is it such good news that this child who was being chased by the powers of the time, by Herod, to be killed and to be executed? Why is that good news of great joy? Why did the angels rejoice? Why did the shepherds rejoice? Why did the magi come and fall down before the throne and rejoice? Why was there joy? There was joy because just for the very reason that God entered into our world, that we are now invited into his world, into his reality, into his redeemed reality. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you today for the story of Christmas, how it comes to us in so many different ways, and, and even as it comes to us um, in a revolutionary way. Lord, I pray that as um, 
We hear these texts and we hear these words from Mary. We hear these words from, um, from the book of Hebrews. That we would both perk up and recognize that perhaps there's something to take from it because we're on both sides. That maybe we are ones with power. Maybe we are ones with wealth. Maybe those things are blinding us to who you are and to what you want for us. Maybe the joy that we think we have isn't the joy that we know we want. But Lord, I pray that this Christmas, that we in seeing this, uh, this revolutionary aspect of Christmas would have eyes wide open how your spirit might work, how your spirit might work in and through our lives this Christmas. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I, ending on that note, want to change the bulletin a little. I want to sing Joy of the World now. And then we'll sing, uh, and we'll sing angels we've heard on high. At the end. So we could joy to the world, uh, page page thirty nine, the green hymnal. <laughs> Church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please share this peace with one another. standing now at this time for the prayers of the church. Um, I'm going to add a couple of prayer requests as well. Uh, one would be for, um, for Millie, for Millie Leopard. She hasn't been in church the last couple of weeks. She's been, um, she took a couple of falls and has been having some dizziness and things like that. So um, uh, I was over to see her here a couple days ago and it was, she, was, she was doing well, but it's hard to be out of the house and stuff on ice and snow. So keep her in your prayers. And then also um, uh, for, for Dottie. Um, uh, Dottie and Raymond, have, uh, they've been um, at home quite a bit here uh, this winter as well. So please keep her uh, in your prayers. Uh, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we come before you today and we thank you. We thank you for the season that is the Christmas season. Uh, we pray that as we uh, as we enter into the depth and the uh, the largeness of this story, uh, that we would see that within uh, and, ab- and among and above and beyond all the stories that are that are so common and the and the ways in which Christmas does, in fact. Uh, cause good feelings to rise, that we would also recognize that Christmas at its heart is such a, such a, it cuts through reality in such a way as to introduce a new reality. A reality where the God, where you being the creator, 
have come into this world full of all of the uh, darkness and, and murkiness that exists here, and by your incarnation have set off a series of events that lead to the redemption of each and every one of us and of the whole entire creation itself. And we pray that as we consider this reality this Christmas season, that we would be encouraged and strengthened to share the story, uh, and that it would ultimately bring joy, the joy that only you can bring into our lives. For us and for your whole church, Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for the nations today. We pray for um, the the different points of conflict around the world. We, we think of um, Afghanistan and Syria and Yemen and uh, other places of, of terrorist activity and wars that are happening. And as we think of you being the Prince of Peace, we ask that your peace would come to this broken and conflicted world. Lord, we pray for our own nation, and we continue to ask for um, for peace between um, competing interests. We pray for peace uh, between different political parties and viewpoints. We ask that uh, all of the conflict and division that exists in the country right now would somehow find find unity, Lord, that you would guide our leaders and each and every one of us to having, to being able to see the common good, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those in need today. We think of the many that, uh, that we have in our community and in our church community. Throughout this community, we pray for, uh, for Emery. Lindgren, for Irene Weigel, and for Deb Bukestead, Janet Peterson, her, her daughter Jennifer McDermott, Helen Seafeld, um, Susie Nitsky's niece Amanda and Amy Carlson, Jerry Lugadensky, Carolyn Seitz, Brad Anderson, so many, Lord God, that are, are battling different types of either recovery from surgery, health concerns, or, or battling cancer. We ask for your hand of healing to be upon them, to continue to guide them and strengthen them in, their, in the difficult paths that they are each walking. We pray as we think of this time of year and those who have lost loved ones over the past year or the past couple of years, how lonely this time of year can, can be. We pray that you would provide your presence, that you would provide company and, and companionship to those who are lonely. And for all the needs that are, that are here and represented by each of us that carry needs with us that sometimes go unmentioned, we pray that we give those needs to you and ask that you would, that you would provide for whatever needs we have. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, we pray, uh, Father, for, for this church. And we thank you, uh, we thank you so much for the work you're doing here, that your spirit is present and active. We pray that you would give us an open, an open heart and an open mind to hear your voice, to see your will, and to walk according to your path into whatever the future might hold. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing for our...
closing him, which now will be Angels We Have Heard on High, page 71. <laughs>